People with the modern era of animation, or even the public, always tend to idealize Walt Disney as a man who made traditional, more modern animated works in the early 1900s. However, as time and history say, that's not nearly true. Animation existed for well over 30 years before Walt even entered the stage. And while animation at the time was a little crude, unrefined, none of that truly compared to the artist that was Windsor McKay. McKay is what many regard as the best animator of his time, going in with exceptional depth, weight, story ideas, and means to push the industry to further heights in the 1910s, an entire decade before Disney made his debut. Zenas Windsor McKay was born anywhere between the years of 1866 till around 1870 in the small town of Woodstock in Upper Canada. He heavily changed his origins to friends and the press alike, claiming to be both born in 1969 and 1971 to different people over the years. McKay began to go by his middle name around the same time his artist talents took root at the age of four or five. According to his own family, McKay would, would actively draw anything and everything he could find, from fire to ducks to fantastical things he read about in books, detailing it all with mastering skill at such a young age. Additionally, McKay would go to Detroit via train to draw sketches for people in 25 cents at the Wonderland and Eden Museum and Dime Museum. As a result of this, he moved to Cincinnati around 1889 and began working for the Cincinnati Enquirer to do sketches and ads in the paper. However, advancing in his sketches, McKay would move to New York and work with William Randolph Hearst and his paper under the comic artist Richard Alcat. It was here where McKay truly took off in his talents, working with Alcat on his first ever comic, Mr. Goodenough. The comic never really became much of a success due to low interest from both readers and upper management. The prints were eventually shut down and the comic retired. Yet, McKay continued onward and made more comics, eventually creating Little Nemo in Slimmerland in 1905. The comic immediately became a smash hit with high reader engagement with the child protagonist in the whimsical adventures he would dream of. However, it should be noted that some of these comics are exceptionally racist in a depiction of Native Americans and Africans alike. Granted, this was the humor of the day, but this still does not excuse the actions that these were very, very racist depictions of these social groups. Moving on from that aspect though, McKay did eventually take off from that work and eventually began to push into his new favorite medium, animation. McKay was always fascinated with anime works, especially from J. Stewart's Blackton and Emile Cole. So, McKay elected to take his own works he had already and adapt them into the animated format, starting off with Little Nemo. McKay always attempted to innovate wherever medium he could use, from growing panels to enlarged perspective, or in the case of animation, using color in several thousand drawings to convey smooth motion to and fro. Just look at it. McKay was truly the first animator to incorporate weight, size, movement, and feel all into his works and make them flow naturally. Despite the minimal background or a heavy plot, McKay was able to make arguably the best looking hand drawn animation at the time up until Disney began his work in 1928. Despite him only making really four total pieces of animation that have survived to the modern day, all of them continue to push the boundaries to make animation a true form of art and attempted to compare it to drama pieces from the same era. Whereas if we look to how a mosquito operates, McKay was able to go ahead and demonstrate the weight and balance of a mosquito on a small surface and make it feel more real. Obviously it's not, but it gives the appearance of a real creature in a real world. Furthermore, McKay's vaudeville tours introduced the world to Gertie the Dinosaur. While the character of Gertie did not leave much of a significant impact on the larger society as say Felix the Cat, the act was a scripted interactive show. Possibly one of the first and earliest examples of a medium all the way back in 1914, with crowd and creator interacting with the drawings. Additionally, Gertie continued to build upon McKay's previous work, demonstrating solid weight and power behind each movement. You can even notice Gertie's feet spread out as she walks. Unintentional or not, is a remarkable detail an animator so early has noticed and incorporated. McKay's style continued to evolve during the 1910s with each new short he released and more aspects of comet animation were pioneered in his name. 
And as the First World War broke out, McKay decided to get in on the action as well. Still working for Hearst, McKay produced his final surviving at least animated short known as The Sinking of the Lusitania. Here, McKay proved to everyone why he was the best animator of his day. The short encompassed everything McKay has been doing for the past 8 years of his career and well before any of his hand sketches. Accurate boat layout, cinematic camera movement, angles, people moving along the ship, the whole film seemed alive. Not something seen in many shorts back in the day, not even today, with TV shows not really incorporating much background movement either. McKay pioneered techniques and ideas used by later artists in more animated works, such as The Prince of Egypt or Atlantis' The Lost Empire. The movement of the water in his shorts is also something of note. The movement, while a little exaggerated, is realistic enough to make it more believable. It also helped that water movements were incorporated integrated the dinosaur as well. And with Gertie being an interactive stage show, it made the whole experience seem that much more magical. Additionally, there's some color in the shots and shadows. What many today could view as a bit more hard to see and a little bit more bare bones, it still portrays the dramatic event with a serious and depressing light, ironically enough. The coloring on the short also adds to the tone of the animation and made it into the picture that will, quote, the picture that will never have a competitor. General audiences were stunned by a level of detail and craftsmanship. Critics were silenced by its heavy tone and beautiful visuals. Truly, is what McKay's entire career was building up to at that time. McKay would produce a few more animated shorts using cells, but never really release them to the public due to the patents owned by Bray Studios. Because of Bray patenting all these techniques, he put a stranglehold on the animation industry. Because of this, McKay took distance from the entire idea of animation, stating in a speech, quote, Animation is an art. That is how I have conceived it. But as I see, what you fellows have done with it is making it into a trade. Not an art, but a trade. Bad luck. While McKay will still do drawings for different companies around the east coast of the United States, he would never really find success nor the appeal for the industry ever again. But it's not like that was really going to matter much, as McKay would die in 1934 of a, from a cerebral embolism. Studios who contract McKay as artists quickly moved on to replace him, as family did what they could do with their inheritances. The quality of animation in the early 1900s on McKay's passing and retirement slumped back down. More stiff and rigid cartoons premiered after 1918. It would not be until Walt Disney, the man inspired by Winston McKay, took to the stage of animation and turned it into what we know as today. But his legacy lived on. Little Nemo and Slumberland got a 1989 adaptation in honor of McKay. While the film isn't really much to write home about, it is still a great way to tribute him. Additionally, the Annie Awards, starting in 1972, released the Winston McKay Award to recognize outstanding achievements in animation. If that has not expressed how great of an animator Winston McKay was, then just in four films he went down in history as the best of his class and beyond, I don't really know what does. <laughs>